started. So to begin, my name is Kelly Gilson and I'm the Executive Director with United Way Oxford and I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us this evening. We're really excited about our first ever webinar on a, an important community topic. We will begin this meeting by acknowledging that we are meeting on Indigenous lands and that have been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we are grateful for the opportunity to meet here, and we thank all of the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, as we gather here, there have been Indigenous peoples who have been the stewards of this place. In particular, we acknowledge the, the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, the Lanape, and the Haudenosaunee. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic and current connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions of the Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous and are making, both in shaping and strengthening this community, in particular, our province and our country as a whole. As settlers, this recognition of the current contributions and historic importance of Indigenous peoples must also be clearly and overtly connected to our collective commitment to make the promise and the challenge of the truth and reconciliation real in our own communities, and in particular to bring justice for murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls across our country. I thought it was very fitting to open with a territorial acknowledgement. And so um, thank you again for joining us. Each, um, uh, just to give you a very brief overview, uh, this is hosted by United Way Oxford and United Way is 100% local and we have strong local community knowledge and a volunteer base. Um, for those of you not really familiar with us, we invest in three very interconnected and relevant areas, uh, moving people out of poverty to, to greater possibility building strong communities filled with healthy people and making sure that children and youth in our community have what they need to grow into healthy um, adults as they transition into adulthood. And so, as you can appreciate, over the last uh, eight months or so, we have seen uh, an incredible challenge across Oxford County, across the country and across the world, quite frankly, uh, with the impact of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And what I, I do want to just quickly point out is in addition to the ongoing and normal funding investments that United Way makes each and every year um, in vital community social services, um, we have in the last eight months invested over half a million dollars additional dollars um, to groups across our county um, as they work to serve those that are most impacted by the pandemic. And, you know, there's a a lot of uh, organizations will talk about, we might be in the same sea, we might be in the same storm. We are all suffering through this pandemic. I know that, we all know that, but we are not suffering equally. Uh, we are in different boats, if you will. And so um, for those that are being impacted the most, we are so pleased that we can work with groups who can make a difference in, in people's lives. Um, and above and beyond our normal fundraising, which I think is often what people think about United Way as doing, um, we, in, we, we not only make those investments, but we're committed to building community capacity, creating awareness of issues, and inspiring volunteerism. And so we have a new Women United group. We're kind of blending all of that here this evening. Um, and if you want to visit our website, you can learn more about Women United and some of the other work that United Way does here in, in Oxford County. I will also point out if um, you didn't hear me as we were kind of rambling while we were getting started or before we got started, this is our first um, webinar. We are really excited to make this a regular and ongoing experience, but because it's the first, please bear with us. So if there's technical issues or in my case, barking dogs, I apologize and we're, it's all part of the learning. Um, so we're, we're here to, uh, to, I, I do want to thank our community members for joining you. It, we have almost 100. I think we have 97 
um, online from all across Oxford County, from all different backgrounds and, and perspectives who are joining us this evening. So thank you so much for, for tuning in. And thank you for taking the time in advance to, of course, watch the film. I'd like to thank Easy Way for their sponsorship because they made this possible for us to do. And so we're very grateful for that. And of course, to our amazing panel who are going to really fill everyone in on uh, what some of the needs are in the county, but also what some of the great services and what, what's happening so that you can have a better understanding. Like most things, there will be some rules um, and procedures. And so the rules are that um, we are going to be speaking about our local situation uh, with the lens from the film, for sure. But we are going to be speaking about the local homeless situation, but not about individuals. That would be inappropriate. Um, please, everyone know that this session is being recorded um, and it will be um, available on our website so that you can view it later or you can um, send others to view it. So because of that, the people that you see are our panelists and those are the only people you will see. Everyone else has had their camera and their microphone disabled for the, for the event. So we, that gets me to the questions. There will be time at the end to take some questions. I know that we're going to be maxed out on time. So I can't promise all questions, but we'll do our best. And in order to do the questions, you can type your questions in the chat box and we will do our best to get to them towards the end of this session. Um, and so remember that uh, when we record these meetings, everything is recorded. So I just will keep that, uh, point that out to you. So now about the film. Uh, it's a powerful film, and I hope that each of you had, have had that opportunity to watch it. And although it was filmed in BC, it could take place, and filmed in BC a decade ago almost, um, it could take place in any Canadian town um, or city, and including our towns and cities here in Oxford County. Us and Them shatters misconceptions about why people end up on the streets. And it reveals why the pull yourself up by the bootstraps narrative is heavily flawed. Um, as Donella, one of the people in the film reveals, leaving the streets is not as simple as going to a neighborhood shelter. She found herself banned from multiple shelters because of violent night terrors that she was afflicted with, caused by the death of her son. So things are not always simple. Um, they're also not always what they seem. So the goal of us and them is to educate as many people as possible on the realities of homelessness and to encourage proactive solutions. Filmmaker Krista Loughton wants people to watch the film and never look at a street person or themselves in the same way again. And I hope that's been your experience. We showed this film last year, uh, literally last November at Calvary Church, and we followed it with a panel um, to discuss, again, much like we are doing tonight, the local context. And last time, our panel included um, Operation Sharing, The Inn, Indwell Harvey Woods Loss, and Carol, who is a, a volunteer with us who shares her personal story as a 63-year-old um, who spent six weeks living on a park bench in Victoria Park here in Woodstock. So um, this time we've asked different agencies to join the panel uh, to continue to deepen awareness and build knowledge. So I, I just wanted to point that out, that while we, we will be referring to the organizations here, and I think that people will probably be referring to other services and organizations um, that may not, that we can't have on the panel because there's not enough time, please know that there are amazing groups doing amazing work. So organizations like Operation Sharing and The Inn and Ingersoll District Inner Church and all of the Salvation Armies and DASO and faith groups and more. And, and these are groups, these are organizations and volunteer groups that are do, working tirelessly to help vulnerable people across Oxford County. Um, and of course, we have to mention the really great work of the Human Services Department at the county. Uh, both staff and, and county council are committed towards working uh, or committed towards a 100% sheltered goal and supporting affordable housing initiatives. And so we are very grateful for that um, government leadership at that local level as well. So now to our panelists, I'm going to ask you each to introduce yourself um, and a quick little overview of 
who you, where you work. Um, one might be obvious, but the rest perhaps not. Um, <laughs> so where you work, what you do, and, and sort of your role here. And we'll just take a couple of minutes. And so we will start uh, with Inspector Marcy Shelton from the Woodstock Police Services. And uh, Marcy is also our 2020 United Way Oxford Campaign Chair. So Marcy. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you everyone for coming tonight and to the panelists that I'm sharing this screen with. Um, as Kelly mentioned, my name is Marcy Shelton. I am an inspector with the Woodstock Police Service, and I have been an Oxford County resident for my entire life, um, except for the time that I spent uh, going away to university uh, to study criminology. Um, I began my policing career in 1993 and throughout my career, I've had many opportunities to work in many different areas, including frontline patrol, criminal investigations, courts, frontline supervision. Um, in 1996, I started my family. Um, I am married to a local farmer, and I have three adult children. Um, at that time in my career, when I started my family, I was the first female ever in the department to be pregnant in uniform. In 2019, I was promoted to my current rank, um, a management uh, position, and again, I was the first female in um, Woodstock Police Service to uh, reach that, that goal. Um, I'm very proud of all the volunteer work that I do within my community. Uh, from a young age, I was always involved and during my career, I've been active on various community boards, including United Way for numerous years. Um, I've coached community sports and have been active in the community music and theater in Woodstock, Embro and Ingersoll. Um, my position with the Woodstock Police Service and my community allows me to be in a position to help with the homeless situation in Woodstock. As an officer, I've seen firsthand uh, the personal trauma, drug addictions, and mental health struggles that can have a huge impact on individuals and also how it has a huge impact on our community as a whole. Um, by working in partnership uh, with so many wonderful agencies in our community, inclu including those that are in attendance both on the panel and as guests tonight. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful and positive that we will be able to find the best possible solution to build stronger communities. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Um, David, I'm going to turn to you next. David Knezevic from the Social uh, Oxford County uh, Community Health Center. Hi, everyone. I uh, just want to echo um, uh, Marcy's comments. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time on a cold Thursday. What a better place to be than with us to talk about a real, real issue in our community that um, it requires all of us to make a different change. Um, so my name is David Knezevic. I'm a, a social worker. Um, I, work at the Oxford County Community Health Center and I run a youth housing program. Um, I'm biased, but a unique housing, uh, youth housing program. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, so my journey started not that much different from some of the kids that I help. Um, not, not like some of this, a lot of the stuff I've seen. Um, however, it's a pleasure to take, you know, what I learned through my own experiences and, you know, getting, succeeding in, in different areas of life and school and being able to kind of come full circle back to where I started. And um, I'm going to tell you a bit when my, when my turn comes up, why, why these kids matter and uh, what it takes to see them through um, as a community. So thank you again, and just look forward to spending this time with you. Thank you, David. So keeping with the Oxford County Community Health Center, I will move over to Amanda Cook. Hi, everyone. Like Marcy, I born and raised in Oxford County, other than there was a year of my life that I did not live here. Um, I have, I come with a lot of lived experience. So my role as an outreach worker at Oxford County Community Health Center is really, my lived experience really can shine through and help I can understand where someone's coming from because of that. 
as the outreach, one of the outreach workers, um, I'm involved with our mobile health outreach bus, which is fairly new, um, just launched in late September. I'm involved with our RAM program, which stands for Rapid Access to Addiction Medicine. Unlike the, um, so we deal with uh, naltrexone and suboxone for alcohol and opioid overdoses with that program. And we look at a client as a whole through that program versus just their addiction, which is really different than if they're going to say the methadone clinic or something like that. Um, I also work very closely with our housing stability program and with our transitional house. So I'm kind of a little bit of here, there and everywhere. I also sit on the situation table, which is another Oxford County initiative. Excellent. Um, and so now we're going to move over to the Canadian Mental Health Association folks. And uh, Lucy, if you would introduce yourself, Lucy Foreman. Sure. I am a, a social worker also, uh, and I've worked with Canadian Mental Health for 15 years. Um, I'm currently the team lead for case management and DBT, but I uh, just spent 15 years working with the court program. Um, so mental health diversion, uh, community treatment court and court support. Um, the one thing that I mentioned to Kelly that I really wanted to get across tonight is the resiliency of people that I've worked with uh, that have lived through homelessness. It's absolutely been a privilege to do this work. And, you know, you start out with uh, these ideas when you're young of, you know, I want to be a social worker. I want to help people. And you realize how much of this as you go along is you're there to walk beside people as they help themselves. You're helping them realize goals that are, you know, no matter where we come from, we, we actually have a lot of similar ideas, what we want for our lives. If you talk to people and get to know them. So thank you for asking me to join tonight. Thank you. Um, and Christine Hillis. Oh, there you are. Sorry. <laughs> Sometimes it gets discombobulating on where the <laughs> who's in what box. are. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Christine. I am also a social worker. I've been with CMHA for about eight years. Um, I've had a bunch of different roles. I started with our crisis team actually as a student and then moved in there as, a, as an employee. Um, I used to do MHART, so I used to hang out with our police officers. I miss doing that. Um, it was definitely a, a great experience to go out with the police and be there for some of those mental health and substance use calls. Um, but now I am an urgent needs case manager. So basically what that means is I am working with the individuals in our community that can't afford to wait on a wait list. Um, so when people have a high level of needs, that means a lot of my clients um, are without a home, no fixed address, um, a lot of substance use issues, a lot of acute mental health issues. Um, so a lot of those people that, again, really just can't wait on a wait list. Um, I get to hang out with Amanda Cook a whole bunch. <laughs> so I also do the uh, mobile a health outreach bus with her on Mondays and hang out with her on Tuesdays for a situation table. Um, yeah. Excellent. And last but definitely not least, um, Stephanie Ellens Clark from the Social Planning Council Oxford. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, Social Planning Council Oxford is a nonprofit that exists to shine a light on poverty and marginalization in our community. And we're trying to work towards positive change. This is usually done through collaboration, um, action oriented type work at the system level, um, shifting mindsets. So thank you so much for having me here tonight. Um, I didn't have anything personal to say, but then I got inspired by other people. So I'm also a social worker. Oh, I think there's a theme here. Um, but I think uh, I actually started my career working in, with individuals at a shelter, uh, emergency shelter in Cambridge. And I got extremely frustrated, not with the shelter, um, but with the system. Um, so I often could just, I couldn't really be much help to people because I just saw all the systemic issues and things that I thought we needed to change in terms of the housing picture and different things we're going to talk about tonight. So um, that's sort of my personal side to it. Um, so I moved more into the, the system level change, um, which can be slow. Uh, and I understand people get frustrated with, with that piece, but it's something as a community we're all working towards together. So I'm excited to talk about that today. 
I'm here representing also so the Oxford Housing Action Collaborative um, and to share some of the work that we're doing together as a community collaborative. We're actually a group of 15 agencies um, that have come together to address housing issues. And that's because we believe that collectively we can actually move the needle on this important issue. So I'm gonna speak more about that tonight, but so thank you for having me. Excellent, so thank you all. We are, um, and we're gonna jump, just jump right in. And so again, for the people um, watching at home, we have some prepared questions that try and kind of capture a variety of areas that I think were themes um, or really highlighted through the film so that we can have a local context. And then after that, we will uh, move into a Q&A from, from the audience. And I know it's a lot and it's a short period of time, so let's go. Um, the s and documentary was a very powerful film that allowed us to really feel connected to Stan, Karen, Eddie, and Donella. Um, it helped me understand the importance of building relationships and trust. Uh, Amanda, uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit about the Oxford County Community um, Health Center's mobile bus? That, as you said, it just launched. But uh, it, so it's new on the road, but how are you going about building trust, you and the team, um, and connecting with folks who are experiencing homelessness across Oxford County, because we know that those bus ha that bus has wheels, um, and can you share a little bit about your successes so far, because I know that there's already early wins. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So how we go about building relationships is when you say you're going to do it, you have to do it. Um, so you can't say, yeah, I'll get back to you on that and never return the call or never speak to them again and treat them like they're people. Everybody is a person and everyone has a story. Most of the time, they're willing to tell you their story. They want to tell their story because they know it could get them help and it helps alleviate like they showed in the movie. It does help them alleviate some of the pain by telling it sometimes. And then if you know a little bit, that's when I bring in my friends like Christine Hillis, who then can help with the CMHA part of that. Um, but the bus itself, so we're in Ingersoll, Tilsonburg and Woodstock already, the three locations. So Monday we do Woodstock out in the morning and the afternoon. Um, Wednesday we do Tilsonburg and Thursday we do Ingersoll. We just, so we have a bus. It carries all our supplies on it. We park the bus at very open locations. Um, and then, so there's myself, well, an outreach worker and a nurse practitioner on the bus. And we just, we walk. We walk, we introduce ourselves to people. We walk up to people. Hey, how's it going? Do you need a snack today? How about some dry socks? You know, do you need a mask? We got extra masks. Just some, some things that we carry with us as we're walking. And then we're like, how are you feeling today? What's going on? And the amount of, at first it was a lot of outreach stuff. So a lot of the outreach already has relationships built. It's easy to build relationships and outreach. You give somebody a pair of socks, they wanna to talk to you. The part where that was hard was the primary care part. So um, Jen Stock, who is our nurse practitioner, her being able to start looking at the wounds because that's a little more intimidating for someone to show like pull their pant leg up or and show the wounds that they have but in the last so i can give you um october's stats which is our first official full month for october so we had 139 interactions in october 89 of those were unique so that means new people that we had never spoke to before 20 of those were medical. So that shows, and we already know for November, our medical is going to be even higher than it was in October. So that's probably later in October when we started getting those. Um, outreach, almost everybody we speak to, we're able to system navigate for, filling out forms while we're there. Um, lots of community connections with other partners that we're doing. We've had a huge success story already. That, so we met a gentleman Week two, I think he came out to see us. So early, like late September, he came out to see us. He was living in the bush, um, so rough sleeping. We got him into a motel for a couple weeks. 
And then eventually, just recently, he moved into our transitional house. And the other day, our housing worker was over there and he was frying up a steak on the barbecue. Like he just felt so at home. I stopped by to see him today and he's settled in and just feels so comfortable there. And now he's there. So for the next year in a bit, or a little less than a year, he's able to stabilize and get ready to transition into his own home, which it's just, it goes full circle. And it just, it's so amazing. Thank you. Um, I, I just do want to say that we were super excited when we actually received an application to, to fund the bus because we were able to invest a um, hundred, almost, a, I think almost $130,000 to get it up and running. And um, we know that it is going to have an investment that will pay off tenfold from healthcare to everything else. So thank you for your good work on that one um, and continued success. Um, in the film, uh, Dr. Gabor Meite, uh, who is a highly respected leader in his field, spoke to the fact that all of his clients had childhood trauma uh, and that addiction is a way to soothe the human spirit, pain and suffering. Christine, um, as an outreach worker who supports people with mental health and addiction issues, do you want to maybe speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. I think there is still this stigma and misunderstanding that, you know, people who use substances are just making this choice. They're making this incorrect choice, right? And there's a lot of judgment about why they're using substances. And absolutely, Gabor Mate has amazing research out there about adverse childhood experiences. And the more adverse childhood experiences somebody has, like, abuse or, um, you know, significant negative experiences in the family home, at school, whatever it is, uh, the more of those that someone has, the more likely they are to develop um, certain conditions and substance use is a big one. Um, a lot of the people that I work with who use substances come to me with significant trauma histories of things that no one should have had to live through. And a lot of them talk about using substances as a way to cope and manage and live with the trauma impact to be able to sleep through the night without nightmares, to be able to get through the day. You know, a lot of people turn to substances for things like that, or we work with people who are using substances and say, it's because I don't have access to a psychiatrist. I don't have access to medication. So using those substances as a way to self-medicate and just kind of get through the day. So I would totally agree with that assessment that a lot of the people that we work with do have quite a lengthy trauma history. Um, and yeah, it is an absolute honor to be able to sit there with people and have that discussion and develop enough of a, a trust and good relationship to be able to talk about some of those traumatic histories. So that's one of the biggest things that sometimes I would get asked or especially uh, with MHART, I would get asked, well, why do people, like, why is that person using drugs? Like, why do people use drugs? And a lot of times that question comes up and my first response is trauma. A lot of people are living with trauma and that's their way to cope and manage it. Thank you very much. That, 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 that is certainly really a, a sad fact of life, I guess. Um, uh, another question, uh, Stephanie, this one's going to be for you, but uh, a common theme throughout the film was the need for stable, supportive housing to be secured before folks can often try and move forward and deal with some other challenges that they are facing. Oxford, like virtually every other community in the country, um, is in a housing crisis with a huge shortage of affordable housing, appropriate housing, um, all, all across the spectrum, right? The continuum of housing. And so as the co-chair of the Oxford Housing Action Collaborative, um, can you share a little bit about how the collaborative, how the group of us that are working together are seeking to collectively look at ways to actually end homelessness here in the county? Sure. Uh, thanks, Kelly. I'm really glad you asked this question uh, because I think it sets the context to what we were talking about earlier, that, that there, this is a system issue. So um, there's been actually some 
politicians have, have taken a stand recently and said that this is not acceptable in our wealthy country of Canada, that people do not have homes. And we've actually had some really exciting uh, legislation that has come through um, related to the national housing strategy, uh, but also provincially as well. So um, I'm, I keep saying on different calls, I'm getting excited um, because I think it's the realization that this is a housing issue, but there's also some other systemic pieces connected. So um, there's going to be, there is dollars that are flowing, which is very exciting. Um, the government of Canada has said by 2030, we're going to be ending chronic homelessness, which is a shift in their, their language. They used to say that they were going to re reduce. Um, and also the province has said by 2025, we're going to end chronic homelessness. So I think there's some political will, but which sometimes comes with the dollars, which then means we can hopefully uh, do more builds, but also find innovative ways locally as well. So the example was given uh, that Amanda made earlier around transition house, um, a newer model. So can we look at renovating um, some existing places and turn them into rentals um, and also provide support? So I think that's another key. Um, so what the housing, um, the Oxford Housing Action Collaborative is excited about, I say everyone's excited, uh, but it's because there have been communities in North America that have ended homelessness. And like that to me really hits home, uh, hits home. That was not intended, but I said that because um, it is possible, right? So it's believing that we can do it. There have been um, a number of communities in, in the state. So uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, um, Lancaster City, Pennsylvania, like there's a a host of them that have ended chronic homelessness. And in Canada, there's been a few that have as well. So Medicine Hat. So there's models that we can look um, towards. And we're really fortunate to have the Canadian Alliance um, to End Homelessness. Uh, they have a program called Built for Zero Canada. And they, can, they basically have gone through and said, here's what those communities do. Here's what you need to do. So the Oxford Housing Action Collaborative is like, collaborative is like okay, <laughs> um, if there's been communities that have ended homelessness, Let's look to that and let's figure out what we can do here. Um, and the first step I'm going to be talking about later um, is registry week. So I'll get, I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, but really, it's about not just housing placements, so having the housing available, but it's also about the system players working together in a coordinated way um, to make sure that we can system correct or, or you know, look at an, a real-time feedback loop and say, why do we have this, uh, you know, why are these extra people have more inflow of homelessness this month? Or um, maybe, you know, we have 10 people that require this type of housing, this type of supportive housing. How can we advocate and make the case for more housing in, in this type of housing? So I think um, there, it is possible to end homelessness. And it's great that I think there's a number of people in the community that um, believe it can be done and we're trying. Um, and I believe all of us can come together and say we have a common vision, all of us in the community, that it's not, it's not right. People shouldn't be without a home. But a, a home is a, is a right. People absolutely deserve that. And you, you just uh, mentioned something very quickly that I will touch on. I think there are often beliefs that uh, the community partners, uh, whether it's in this particular issue or whether it's in food security or any of the others, that they, they operate in isolation and that there's all kinds of duplication of programs and services. And, and really, I, I do think that people need to understand there might be different groups doing very similar programs and services, but that does not mean that they're duplicating um, or that people are, if you will, double dipping, because there is no one one program or one service that's going to be effective for every single person. And so it really is about continuing to build the, the the conversation, the collaboration, the coordination, all of those things. But it's really not because there is so much duplication. It is because there is sadly so much need in, in different areas. Um, so, so David, I'm going to turn to you next. And there are many different faces uh, of homelessness um, from those in the film that um, hopefully everyone saw uh, to those that we see living rough uh, in particular in the downtown cores um, of Oxford County, uh, especially much more visible over the last number of months to the, the pandemic, um, certainly. Um, but there's also couch surfing and people in cars and people 
just sort of um, in, in flop houses or, or, or just different ways that people can try and get a bit of a roof over their head, but they're not stable um, and they may not be safe. And so your work, David, is specifically with youth. Um, and so, you know, you might be seeing um, different faces again, certainly younger faces, sadly. Um, and so can you share uh, what kinds of situations you're seeing with your youth facing and um, how you help them to maintain or obtain some stable housing and, and move forward? Uh, thanks for thanks for asking. Um, it's, it's kind of a trick question um, when it comes to youth, I find, because um, if you ask yourself, like what is housing versus what is a home? And, you know, is there a difference? I, I would say yes. I mean, I can certainly put people in houses. Um, I can just jump in there, put them in houses and, you know, call it a day. Um, yeah, we house people. Um, but we know that's not the case. So when, you know, when you picture going home after a long day of work, like, is that it? No, like there's, <laughs> there's a myriad of things. There's, there's an environment you can expect. There's a safety there. There is a great feeling that you can count on every day. There's a door that you can close and you can feel that door close and kind of shut the world out, right? Like you can, a home, housing is not just bricks and mortar. It's so much more than that. So, I mean, the situations that I run into, um, to tie it back to the movie, if you can take those, uh, those souls in that movie and reverse time <laughs> back to their teenage years, like that, that's what I'm seeing. We're, we're seeing the start of it. Um, well, I wouldn't say the start of it because I work with 16 and 17 year olds. Um, so they've certainly had time to experience a bit of life and, and have some negative experiences as well. So um, we're catching them. Um, we're catching up with them in that final gap before they switch into adulthood. And um, I see a variety of, I mean, what do I see? Uh, it's the human condition. It's broad. It involves infinite possibilities. Um, how I choose to see the youth, how we choose to see the youth, and the larger problem, the problem of homelessness in our communities makes a big difference in how we work with people. So, I mean, on one hand, I see a lot of difficult things through the experiences of the youth I serve. Um, if people know what the social determinants of health are, I see them playing out right in front of me. So, uh, th the conditions that impact a person's ability to grow and thrive in life um, is what we see. So um, income and social status matters. Um, if you can picture being a teenager with nothing or very little or no control over your situation, uh, employment and working conditions, uh, education and literacy, childhood experiences, physical environments, social support and coping skills, access to health services, gender, culture, race, racism, like there's the impacts at a societal level that, you know, set us up either way. Um, I see disabilities, uh, chronic illness, developmental addictions, learning disabilities, physical, sensory, um, undiagnosed or diagnosed, but um, think about being on the spectrum and needing to get an assessment to prove you are. It's a $1,500 assessment. Um, I see mental health, I see anxiety, I see depression, I see isolation. Um, relational issues like broken relationships, broken trust in family and community. I see historical involvement across the board with different systems like child welfare, children's mental health, justice, um, food banks, all of it. Um, they've been there, done that. Um, this is their circle around to say, I can do this um, if, if we help them try. Um, on the other hand, though, I choose to see strength, I see resilience, I see ingenuity, resourcefulness, grit, spirit, I see fight, I see youth with big questions fueled by a soul that's beyond their years. I mean, there's so many things that you can see in these people. Um, so to help youth, I mean, what does it mean to help someone and how do you go about doing it when everyone really is unique and their situation is infinite, right? Um, what you need to know about the youth housing program is referrals can come from anyone anywhere in the county, uh, even outside of the county. There's no wrong door to gain access to, to our help. Um, I'm not, let me take you back to 1943 to Maslow's hier hierarchy of needs. Um, if you don't have a place to sleep that's consistent, if you don't have food, 
you can't go to school. You're not doing well. I mean, to be the best that you can be means that you have the things in place that enable you to do that. Um, so there's a variety of things that can happen, uh, but what we do is we take a whole person approach. We look at everything and essentially partner up with the youth and take an amazing race against time to set them up before they're 18. Like, <laughs> I'm trying to make it, it's really fun. Um, but what really matters um, is that the plans that we make with youth are for them by them. Um, believe it or not, um, youth can have diverging views about where they want to be from their parents, um, from ourselves as service providers. So developing youth-driven, hyper-customized planning that balances needs and wants of the youth and where they see themselves going later in life. We start by asking and listening. I work with youth. I work with their family and friends. I work with whomever they see as valuable and helpful to them. Uh, and we build a community, a micro community of care um, in, in a way that's very specific to the youth and in a way that they find helpful. We set goals with that community of care and we help each other enable the youth to succeed by working together and doing what they find most helpful. I feel like I'm repeating myself, but, and of course the final, like the most important thing is that we help them get access after they turn 18. So, you know, yes, my program ends at 18, but my goal is to make sure you're connected to your next team. Um, and your next service that matters. So, you know, six months before we're trying to connect with our CMHAs, our hospitals, our pain clinics, our, um, you know, where, whatever it is that they need. But overall, um, we do our best to work with, um, enable, share power, learn as a program and a community of providers to do better together and learn with each, each success and challenge along the way. Um, hey. I'm, Okay. Thank you, David. <laughs> uh, that, 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 that really is enlightening. And for those of us that have children, um, and many of our panelists um, have spoken to that, and certainly I know that people in the audience, um, many do as well. Um, I think that touches a really, a, a really big piece of your heart because they're but for the grace of God. And, um, and it's always something that it, it matters, right? Um, so when we are, whether we're discussing poverty in general or homelessness in particular, like we are tonight, um, we often underestimate how living in poverty is actually virtually a full-time job. Um, and in the film, um, Stan has a, a fun little quote one time about how like his panhandling, uh, that's his job. Uh, and he's, he's very sincere that that was his job. Towards the end of the film with stable housing and lots of supports, Stan got to be... Um, uh, a taxi driver so uh you know that was that was just a powerful piece but but poverty really is a full-time job um homelessness as well and so people have to develop sur survival skills and incredible resiliency um lucy could you speak a little bit about the resiliency of people who experience homelessness despite the adversity that they have faced and you touched about that initially um a little bit in the beginning Yes, thank you, Kelly. Um, and David, I just want to say that was a, a really good um, insight into resiliency as well. I, I can't top the words that you used um, for that. So thank you for that. Um, resiliency, when I see, when I see clients, um, I, just to bring it home for people, uh, viewers that might not have had any experience with trauma, uh, think about the last time that you had an argument with somebody and after you walked away, you thought of the perfect thing that you should have said in that moment. I think everybody's had that experience at some point. How much time you spend thinking about that after you've left that conversation, you know, the next day, the next week, if it keeps you up at night, that's an argument that you had about something that was probably trivial. If you can imagine for a moment, people that have experienced childhood trauma and trauma repeated over throughout their lives, re-traumatization from the systems that we all see them dealing with, see us dealing with. Imagine trying to deal with that ruminating thought, those persistent intrusive things, as you try and go about navigating the systems that we have, living on the streets. And I, I know it was mentioned earlier, um, 
especially in Oxford County, a lot of the homelessness that I saw wasn't just sleeping on the street. It was couch surfing, not knowing, you know, the next place you were going to sleep at or sleeping somewhere where you didn't feel like you could fall asleep because you couldn't turn your back. The lights being off is a trigger for you. There's so many things that people take for granted about having a home, but for people that are suffering from all the effects of being homeless, the fact that they can still show up to an appointment with me, show up for their court date, you know, ask for money on the street. Imagine how terrifying that must be. They're able to do that somehow. Where does that come from? It's internal courage. I don't, it's survival. It's many things, but it's just such an amazing thing for me to have witnessed over the years, especially working with the, the court program. Um, most of the people that I dealt with, I'd say 99% had never had any interaction with a mental health professional that they could share with. So resiliency to me, how I saw it was them even being able to trust me. Um, and Amanda, you're right. Being able to fulfill a simple request is often the first step. Thank you very much. Um, we recognize that there is uh, certainly tension around ensuring a vibrant and successful and safe downtowns uh, in our communities and others, um, while also respecting that homelessness is not a crime and that, and that shuffling people is not a solution and that we need empathy and supports as well. In a healthy community, everyone should feel safe, everyone. Um, and individual perception is, is, is your reality. So we hear, and recent reports have indicated, and surveys have sort of indicated that not all community members uh, certainly feel safe, uh, specifically in, in some of the core areas, because they're concerned um, and unsettled about people that are homeless um, or on the streets or use needles on the ground or some of the, these social challenges that we, we face. Um, Marcy, the situation, um, I, I know you're with Woodstock Police. Uh, the situation, of course, is similar, whether it's Woodstock, um, Ingersoll, Tilsonburg, or again, virtually any other um, urban center uh, in our country. Um, but could you tell us a little bit of, about what and how Woodstock police and your officers are doing to, to help and to help people on the street, but also to help the community feel that they are indeed welcome and safe in the core? I can, Kelly, and I, and I agree with you that I don't think Woodstock is very different from other communities and how members feel about their downtown. Um, I think that the perception of being unsafe has always been there, but just looks very different now. Uh, we now have community members who are living on the streets, living out of their grocery carts, not being able to, to afford the necessities that we all should be able to afford, such as food and shelter. Um, this makes us nervous um, to see this. And if we don't have an understanding of how and why that happens, this makes us feel unsafe. Any, any situation that is different or unique, we get nervous and we feel unsafe. Um, for, in my opinion and, and for me, homelessness is a community issue and that the police are definitely one part of that solution. Um, I can speak for the Woodstock police, but, but do know that the Oxford OPP are also facing the same issues in Ingersoll and in Tilsonburg. Um, the Woodstock Police, though, is very involved in the responsibility of the downtown um, and in keeping it safe. Um, we have a dedicated team of downtown core beat officers um, that walk the streets and walk the alleys. Sometimes they're in uniform, sometimes they're in plain clothes, depending on what the needs are. Um, each week is, is a little bit different as to what's going on or what the calls have been recently. Um, they work uh, with the BIA um, and are interacting with our homeless individuals every day that they're out there. Um, we have created uh, a new community response unit. We, we call it CREW. Um, it starts up in January and it's to respond to um, certain needs that we're finding or the way that calls go, such as targeting community issues. Um, that can be 
um, you know, drugs um, within the city, especially in the downtown. Um, it can also include traffic and speeding concerns. Um, that also has to do with the safety of our community. Um, break and enters, theft from vehicles. So this unit that we've created um, will, will basically be a focused, uh, targeted, um, problem-oriented policing way of policing for us. As an organization, we participate in such community uh, committees, such as the Oxford County Drug and Alcohol Steering Committee. We also sit on the situation table. Um, we have our MHART that's available right in our office that, that responds with an officer to a, a person that is in crisis um, at that time. Um, we also, um, are available to assist as we know that mental health is a contributing factor for many that are living on the streets. So having MHART available to us and definitely the new mobile bus um, is another avenue that we have on the street. So thank you very much. Um, uh, we are also part of a working group along with numerous other organizations including United Way, Oxford County Community Care, um, CMHA, the hospital and groups, such as the Inn and the Trumpet of Truth. And we're looking, we're sitting down around the table and trying to come up with, um, you know, solutions to these, the, these increasing concerns that our community has. And tonight I'm here as part of an initiative with United Way to have conversations about what steps our community can take to help find solutions and what solutions are out there for people. Tonight people are learning about these programs that we have to offer. And so now they're more educated and they're, and they're able to make those calls and help people that are in need. Um, our community and resource officers are educating the churches and various social groups and our children at school about such issues as homelessness, drugs, um, human trafficking, all those really difficult conversations that need to be held and, and, we're and we're targeting our youth as well so that they know and they know how to be safe. Um, and we are working every day in partnership with our community agencies trying to find new ways to help. Um, we know that grocery carts and sleeping in vestibules is not what we want to see in our downtown. But when we are called for those trespassing related type calls, uh, they're difficult for us when really all that we can do is, is move them along. And, and the question is, where do we move them to? And those are the solutions that, that we need to come up with as a community. Charging them with trespassing or under a different bylaw isn't, isn't a, is not helping the problem. Um, we need a more solid and lasting solution. So we will continue to work with our community partners as we, we have and, and hopefully find um, you know, rewards for all that are involved um, from the most vulnerable um, and to our community agencies because we have um, stakes involved as well. Um, in the video, us and them, there is a beautiful quote and that we all need someone to cheer us on. And I think that's really important to remember during these times. So Absolutely. thank you. Thanks, Marcy. There were so many wonderful quotes, actually. So touching, moving quotes in that film. Um, and and you know, you you what you've said is it just highlights that there is no one organization or service or um, or group who can actually do this on the on the own. This is a community. Um, that needs to come together. It's a community issue and we need community solutions and we're all in it. And so thank you for, for doing that. And, and I will just give a United Way a little plug. We were, th we're thrilled to be able to be funding the MHART program for Woodstock Police as well as the OPP uh, to uh, enable to give them continued support because mental health calls are a huge piece of the work that you do. And it also helps divert healthcare dollars from going to emerge when um, the emergency department at the hospital is maybe not the best place for people at that particular time either. So that program has great impact all over. So um, CMHA and, and the police keep up that, that good work. Um, 
here's a, an interesting one. I'm going to open this up to anyone um, and all. But I hear all the time people saying that these, these homeless people are not our people. Um, that they, they come in from other communities, they come in by bus. Uh, better yet, I've had so many people tell me that they take, the homeless people take the train to Woodstock, our poor, in particular Woodstock, but in this case, but we treat our poor so well that they come by, by train. Um, and I hear it from all kinds of people in all kinds of, of settings. Um, and we know that that's not true. Uh, we just know it's not true. And so what, other, what misconceptions around homelessness do you wish in your experience that we, we could dispel here this evening? Um, so Kelly, if yes, I don't, Marcy. I'll just jump on here quickly because I'm sure there's, there may be a few responses to this, but for me, it's that all homeless persons are, are not violent or they're not criminals. I mean, we saw in the movie, people in our community that are living on the streets are much like Stan, Karen, Eddie, and, and Donel, Donalda. And uh, many have childhood traumas and other, um, such as sexual abuse, child abuse that they're dealing with. And, and some are living with physical pain and that's why they became addicted to opiates. And that's why they have to be on methadone. And, and or they've lost their jobs or they've left violent marriages and that's what brings them to the street. So I think, yes, there are some criminality to persons that are on the street, but that's not, I mean, they're not choosing to live there. That's for sure. Thank you. Who else would like to jump in on that? Yeah, I, I would totally agree with Mercy. And, and I think one of the, um, big misconceptions is that, you know, people who are homeless aren't trying, they're not, you know, trying to fix their situation. And I find that the people that I work with fight harder than anybody I know, just to survive, to try and better themselves. And they keep getting hit by barrier after barrier, and they keep pushing and keep trying. That honestly, I think that almost everyone that I work with fights way harder than I do every day with their battles. That I think that that's a huge misconception is just that there is this lack of effort. Mm. I'm going to just have one more person go because we're. I, I want to try and uh, get to a, a question with Stephanie um, before we at least hit eight o'clock in case people have to, you know, t take off. David, I was just going to 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 bounce off of Christine there. It's um I think it was uh, Roger Bregman uh, said, you know. Poverty isn't a lack of character, it's a lack of money. Like, we live in a, a world that is defined by money and how much we can accumulate and they fight hard. It's different when you have more, it's just a different experience. And um, the other one is budgeting. Oh my goodness, homeless people need to learn how to budget. I'm like, have you ever lived off 20 bucks a month? Because they can do it, I don't think we can. No. Just, saying, just saying. Yeah, um, you can budget till the cows come home. You still can't spread that out. I mean, if if you ask someone how much they spend on alcohol, I don't know how many of us could actually say that we spend in a month. Like, it's just an example of where we dehumanize people through what we see as negative behavior, but we would never check ourselves in the same breath. So. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get to a question with Stephanie, but speaking of powerful pieces, just to quickly leap off on that, um, Dr. Mateij in the film talks about the addiction, um, but, uh, but not necessarily from drugs and alcohol, but also from exercise and from shopping and all of the other ways that people can experience addiction and, and it soothes you. Um, and I also thought that was very powerful because I think each and every one of us probably could see a piece of us in, in some of that, in some of that behavior. Um, so Stephanie, I'm going to um, jump to you. Uh, later this month, the Social Planning Council and the Oxford Housing Action Collaborative um, and United Way are undertaking a homelessness enumeration project. Could you tell us a little bit about that um, initiative and why it matters and how it's going to help create change? And it's eight o'clock. So I'm just going to say to those that are watching at home, I 
I apologize that we're already there. We'll try and wrap up here in a moment and then get to some of the questions. I know we won't get to all, but we'll try. Sorry, Stephanie, it's yours. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so I mentioned earlier that the Housing Collaborative uh, has decided that uh, we're going to work as a community to end homelessness. And actually, communities that have ended homelessness found that the first step to get there is to actually complete what is called a registry week. So uh, November 23rd to 26th, so about a week and a half away, um, they'll be basically surveying that's going to occur across our community. So we have about 25 um, eight sites or agencies um, that are going to be doing surveying with people experiencing homelessness. And we're also going to be going out um, with the mobile health bus and, and visiting some different encampments as well. Um, the, the reason why this is a first step uh, to ending homelessness, the communities that have gotten there have found, um, is because there's a component obviously of community awareness, so we will be sharing back the results, um, you know, in similar forums to this, but there's also uh, this piece around understanding people's needs and then trying to build a case and plan for certain types of housing, but also trying to work at that coordinated level. So um, what I was mentioning earlier is the, there's the important housing placement piece, um, which we've talked about, but then there's also this whole sort of system um, coordinated effort to try to ensure that we're looking at real time information and trying to correct things at a system level. So working with the individual at the individual level, but then also trying to look across the system. So we're pretty excited uh, about this and we will share back with the community. Um, the other piece is it leads to what is called a by name list as a community. And so that's what, what I was mentioning, that whole system response where we work with individuals, but then we also work across the system. So this is kind of, uh, it's exciting again, I like that word. Um, but if you are interested in the results, um, we are uh, using the hashtag housing Oxford um, over the next few weeks. Um, you can also visit our website and we have a listing of all the sites. Um, if people are interested in participating in the survey, um, they will be, people will be compensated for their time, which is standard practice with surveying. Um, so we do have on our website also the um, phone number if, if you do have access to a phone and you want to participate or the sites listed there that you can attend um, to participate. Um, so it's spcoxford.ca. I can put it in the um, chat box, but forward Idea. slash adequate dash housing. So um, we're really looking forward to sharing that information with you, but also working with folks experiencing homelessness to kind of get an understanding of current needs. That is excellent. Um, I, uh, I, I'm not going to ask this question, but I'm going to kind of make a statement because I, I think it, um, it will just help before we move into the next piece. Uh, but in the film, there were a number of references to the kindness of strangers, the lasting impact that that kindness had and how very much it was appreciated. And so for people that are listening at home tonight, um, I think that there are so many ways that you can have um, a meaningful, impactful interaction by helping someone, uh, whether it's making eye contact and saying hello, or treating someone to a coffee, um, or you know, socks. Kind of to Amanda's point earlier, at this time of year, and as we get, I mean, winter is coming, darkness is coming. That there are just so many ways that we can each make a difference um, and, and, and people would be ever so grateful. Um, so, so as we, uh, again, I mentioned at the beginning of the, the session that the panelists for this, this time, this, this event, um, were a little different than the panelists we used the last time. But again, each and every one of the organizations here and some of the others that we've referenced are all incredible incredibly important pieces of this overall community puzzle and how we can work together and how we can um, help people and influence change and influence awareness because I think that that is really um, we need to have understanding we need to be aware of what the what the issues are we need to know where there are gaps and, and services and how we as a community can help prioritize some of that um, and we have to be able to, to do that in order to help 
reduce some of that um, the misunderstanding or that you know that nimbyism right that not in my backyard piece um, that happens of course everywhere because if you don't know and you're a little scared or unsure um, it, it creates a, you know you don't want to be involved in that so so creating awareness is is a piece of what united way does um we were thrilled that we are thrilled that we have been able to fund and provide stable funding for some of those organizations that were on our panel last time I mean, you know folks like indwell harvey woods lofts and and some programs and uh but also here today um every one of these organizations United Way is funding and supporting and investing in because they're doing really good work and work that really matters in the community and and that's how we make a difference um, and that's how each of you make a difference and so um, on that I'm going to actually before we get to some of the um, questions in the box I'm going to just turn it over to Marcy um, to because she is our 2020 campaign chair uh, to see if she can do a shameless plug for us on why she believes in the work of united way and her commitment um, to helping us as we invest in in our community um so i took on the role of campaign chair not only because i can't say no to kelly but because i believe in the work that united way does um, I've seen, like I said before, firsthand through my years on the police service and definitely through my years of volunteering as a board member on the United Way, um, that the money raised may, makes a significant impact to so many people across Oxford County. I've seen as a member of the United Way Allocations Committee how it is not only those agencies that write the best funding requests that receive the funding, but also those individual small agencies or persons who have the most heart and belief in their program um, that they are proposing that they can get the funding to. And that's really important. Uh, this year during the pandemic, I have witnessed how United Way had the opportunity to really make an impact and support new counseling services for mental health, um, supported MHART, uh, the mobile bus, um, Everyone had to change the way that they were doing things and, and United Way was able to, to help so many different organizations with the funding that they needed to make that happen. Um, all these community partners are invested in improving our community and, and we're able to do so um, through funding provided to them by the United Way. Um, United Way is committed to accountability and transparencies and the dollars that are donated are used to meet the needs of our community and they stay in Oxford County. Uh, for many, that's very important when they are donating. Um, if you haven't donated yet, please consider. Um, you can visit the United Way website or reach out to any of the wonderful staff members to make a donation. Um, if, you've, if you've already made a donation this year, thank you very much. A warm thank you to everyone. Um, as I said before, as quoted, I really do think this is a great quote. We all need someone to cheer us on and we can all help spread the local love. So thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Uh, we are very grateful for that and for you taking on this role in such a a strange and unsettling time for, for all of us, for sure. Um, so now I'm gonna get to a few of the questions um, that have been um, submitted by individuals. So um, one, in the panelist experience, what do people living in homelessness in Oxford County say about the services that are available to them and what gaps are they identifying? I can uh, add a suggestion to that. Um, in my experience, the, the general rule is living on a waiting list. Um, it's not a matter of that there's no resources, there's just not enough. From a youth perspective, um, I, I hope this isn't too soul crushing, but um, they, they see when, when we don't want when we can't when we can't help them it's internalized as they don't want to help mm. um I, I ran into that the other day and i just it it has to stop you when you hear that um how do we stop that from happening um, so like nothing's perfect but yeah we got to listen when they say okay 
I would echo what Lucy said, the wait list. It always seems a wait list. And it's actually surprising that some of them really don't know the resources themselves either. So needing something and then going, oh, if someone like myself says, oh, oh, we can get you that. They're like, oh, I didn't know that was out there from help, right? So just the knowledge of what is really out there sometimes. I think flexibility too, like flexibility of services. Um, a lot of the people that I work with are sometimes just too unwell to make scheduled appointments, to go into buildings that they've never been to before. They're told, you know, you have to show up here at this time to meet with this person that you've never met before, that we do have to be more flexible where, you know, like yesterday my client was late for appointment. I called her up and just drove to whatever location she was at and went for a walk. Like you just have to be flexible and meet people where they're at because we like, we just can't live in this rigid structured scheduled world. Mm -hmm. um, if I could just add, oh, sorry, David, I'll let you go first. It's the United Way Youth Spaces. I, I can't remember the title of the report that came out, but um, this idea that we can't serve youth better in community in existing spaces um, but they feel it. Um, it all, yeah, the bouncing around the what's available to me. I don't want that service right now. I'm actually on this kind of, this is where I'm at, not there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they, they really want us to get it right. They want us to make community accessible and, and do better by them. I I would like to think that we all want to get it right. Um, and, and so for those listening, I will also mention 211. Um, also a United Way funded program actually, but 201 is now has national coverage across the country in Canada. And 211 is a 24 hour, seven day a week free information and referral source. So there is a website piece, but there's also the beauty of um, qualified staff, uh, local organizations submit all their information into this big database, but if you call, they can, they can give you information, they can track information, they can even check back. So uh, 211 is really something that we need to be using far more than we do, and it's because we're not aware of it. The community is just not aware of the program. Um, homelessness has increased almost everywhere in the developed world in the last 30 to 40 years. Um, do any of you want to weigh in on why you think that might be the case? I can't speak to everywhere in Canada, but just from an Oxford perspective, um, I, especially, you know, the last few summers, winters, even, I guess, uh, looking for an apartment with somebody in Oxford and finding a rent that first of all fits what they can afford, um, and isn't, you know, I, if you just want to take a look at the listing sometimes of what's available out there, uh, imagine trying to spend um, less than $1,000 even on a one bedroom. Uh, if you have any kind of um, difficulty presenting yourself to that landlord, you're not going to get in. Um, I've even worked with people that have had family that were willing to pay extra to get them into a place just to, because they had no luck and we're still told no, because landlords will still go through that check. They've got the pick of the, the lot. There's uh, a huge um, shortage of housing in general and the price is going up and up and up. Um, even the cost of real estate for landlords to be able to provide, it's not just landlords being evil and counting their dollars, right? Like it's, Landlords that want to be helpful, but they have to pay their bills as well. The bills of everything have gone up and, you know, incomes have not gone up to match. Mm -hmm. uh, income support from ODSP, OW has not gone up to match. Mm -hmm. um, we have as a county, I mean, each community has a slightly different vacancy rate, but as a county, we virtually have a, a zero vacancy rate. I think anything under 3% is considered zero. Um, and so we hover kind of between one and two, depending on where, but the price of, of apartments now has a one bedroom has gotten, uh, you know, they say you can get something for, for 800, 850. You really probably can't. It's a thousand. It's more. Um, and what people may not realize is if you're on, on um, Ontario disability support, ODSP, um, you're bringing in $1,200 a month. So when you're supposed to be spending no more than 30% of your income on all of your housing costs, so your rent, 
your insurance, your gas, your heat, all of that. Um, mm. There are so many that are spending 80, 90% or more um, just to put a roof over their head. Um, yeah. Can, sorry, sorry I'll go put, ahead. Yep. I'll put, put something in the chat, um, but Lucy just said exactly what I was going to say. It's really the financialization of housing. I um, watched a movie that totally like opened my mind. Um, it's called Push, and I can put in in the chat box a uh, link to a movement that's happening across the world called The Shift. Um, but it's basically the uh, Leilani Farhani, Ferrari, I think it is, from um, United Nations. She was the uh, rapporteur that went around the world to look at why are we in the world having a housing crisis. And it's really about uh, capitalism and, and how money is made from housing uh, and the market. So I'll put that in the, in the chat box, but I think that's a huge uh, reason why. So um, here's a question. It's recognized that the responsibility for social services uh, for Oxford belongs at the county level, um, but it should also be recognized that homelessness is such a growing issue that the county requires uh, assistance and support from others. What is the role of the city of Woodstock and presumably other municipalities regarding homelessness and what plans are in place or under development to work with other levels of government uh, to address this problem in the city? Um, and so because we don't have um, government representation at this table, it's, it's uh, you know, mostly social service nonprofit groups, um, but the, I, I, we can't answer that per se. But what I will say is, um, it really goes back to that comment we've made time and time again this evening that it is going to take everyone, that no one group, no one organization um, has the resources or the ability to do this on their own. It truly is all of us having up to find a way to come together. Um, and so whether you're um, joining us this evening from the city of Woodstock or town of Ingersoll or town of Tilsonburg or elsewhere in the in the county, um, if this is something that really matters to you, if you are uh, uh, particularly concerned about what's happening in the communities that you live in here in the county, then I would suggest reach out to your elected officials, find out what they, what they have to say, make sure that they understand that this is something that you prioritize because I think that will help them as they are trying to work through their own ch funding challenges and, and, and prioritization work as well. Um, sorry, da, da, da. let me see, what, um, what is the criteria uh, to be in the transitional housing and what services are offered there? Uh, Amanda, do you want to take that one? Sure. So there is an application process that needs to be completed to get into it. So the best resource, if you're looking to find out the details of it, is to call Allison Leger at 519-539-1111, extension 222. I'll put that in the chat for everyone. Um, and she can go over an intake with you for the Housing Stability Program, which then, if it comes out within that application that you might be a fit for transitional house, then she'll look at the application for that. What was the rest of it? I think that was it, wasn't it? Uh, and the services that you have there. So there is a housing stability worker that pops in probably at least daily. Um, with COVID, it looks far different. Um, we did uh, open it up at the beginning of COVID to get some homeless off the street. As soon as COVID hit, it was kind of, we need to get this open. Um, thank you for putting that in, David. Um, so... They're right now we try to we do some programming if we can so they do like some craft nights things like that but it's really just teaching them how to apartment search how to present themselves um, getting them hooked up with all the other services as well so when moving forward in their lives when they're ready to and can able to find an apartment of their own um, how to also maybe look for a job if that's what they're interested in so we, we have a worker that's there to support them with any needs that they have that come up. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, here's one. I, oh, sorry. I live on the periphery of the county near a village that is not big enough to have a downtown, uh, much less street people hanging out. Um, however, I'm sure there is couch surfing and people at risk in my neighborhood. Uh, what can I and the organizations I'm involved with do to let these people know of the superb services that Oxford has to offer? And rural, so we're a rural community, period, but rural homelessness um, is really an issue. And people are, um, we know that they are finding an affordable place way out in the country, perhaps, but then, then they're stuck there as well. And so rural homelessness really, um, or or precariously housed is an issue. Would someone like to jump in on that one? I would just say, um, you know, invisible homelessness has always been a thing. Um, I think when we think homelessness, we think, you know, out on a street, pushing a cart, you know, pitching a tent, all that stuff, which certainly happens. But the number of folks that I hear from who are in their 40 plus years reflecting on how, just how many people they knew um, were relationship couch hopping, house hopping. Um, it's always been here. So what can you do? Name it, have conversations at the dinner table, start there, um, talk to your local representatives. So if you have, you have, you have a mayor or, um, you know, call one of us, call Stephanie, call like, <laughs> we're all here to help you do that. Um, but certainly don't struggle by yourself with it. Um, bring the community in to, to and, and we can help you. Okay. Um, I, I know yeah. we won't go, oh, sorry. I was gonna say as well, like I think sometimes it is just those like personal connections, right? As community members forming those personal connections with other people in your community. We live like such an isolated life now, even before COVID and social isolation, where we don't talk to people in our community anymore. We don't smile at our neighbors. We don't have those conversations. But I think for the average person in our community, just building those connections with other people you know, and just, that way maybe they know that you might be a safe person to come to later with like, hey, I have this problem. Like, have you ever heard about this? Or they're venting to you about whatever. And then maybe you share some community resources or something like that. But I think for the average person in our community, it's just building those personal connections. Okay. Um, on top of, um, sorry, what about trying on top of the housing discussions uh, is we need more assisted living as well for people with mental health issues that are not able to properly care for themselves. There are a lot um, out there deemed incompetent or semi-incompetent. Um, and so how are we helping there and, and what opportunities are there to expand that? Um, and I know that that's talked uh, a lot about that need for support at our um, housing uh, action collaborative table, but would anyone like to talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. We would love to see more supportive housing. That, that is honestly one of the biggest struggles that I have in my role is helping people find housing when they're not stable with their mental health is so challenging. Like Lucy said, like trying to go apartment hunting with someone who is unwell or even, you know, we find someone housing, but they can't maintain that housing because of their, their symptoms or issues that they're dealing with. So it's, it's this issue of people can't get stabilized until they get housing, but then it's hard to really work on your mental health if you don't have housing, like David was saying with like the hierarchy and needs, like for me to do counseling with somebody when they don't know where they're going to sleep tomorrow isn't realistic. So we live in this kind of in-between of do we stabilize first and then house, do we house and then stabilize because there's really no great solution either way, which I realize now sounds very dark, um, but we really are hoping for more uh, housing that can offer that support because places like Indwell are amazing and they offer that support and we just want to see more of it in our community. I think there is a huge need here that those spots would get filled. Absolutely. Thank I you. do want to throw in there too, we do have an amazing uh, supportive housing team within CMHA. Um, 
I wish they were here tonight, actually, because this is very relevant to the work that they do. Uh, but I'm sure they would tell you that they provide support and housing as well as subsidies for people with mental health and addictions issues uh, in our community. Um, but yeah, I could go on for probably a couple of days about that. So. Uh, we have enough to have another panel the next go round as yeah. well. So we can, all, you know, thankfully there's, there's, there are lots of services. I know we still need more, um, but, but we, we do have some great people doing some wonderful work. Um, uh, here's a question. A friend of mine does overnight cleaning at downtown businesses in Woodstock. She often finds people sleeping in bank entrances. How can we reach these people that are missing on the opportunities Oxford's providing for homelessness? Um, what is happening that they can't get into a shelter for the night? Is the reach far enough to find these people so that they can know where to go for help? Um, and, and I would venture to say that not everyone um, wants to go to the shelter or can go to the shelter. And I, I think for people in the community who may not be aware, there is only one um, sort of official shelter in Oxford County, and that is um, run by Operation Sharing through the Inn uh, here in Woodstock. But would anyone like to speak to about how we can try and get um, people a little more help? So, so Kelly, just to speak, I'll just speak really quickly on this, but um, from a policing point of view, like um, people can call us. I mean, we're a 24 seven service. And if somebody sees somebody in need, especially those people that are doing night cleaning or, or delivering papers or whatever, they see, they see these individuals in areas and, and they can call us and we can try to assist them at the time. No doubt it's difficult to find them, but at least, I mean, we, at the very least, we do have a front lobby if it's minus 20 and they need a, they need a warm place to, to sit at the front. Um, certainly with our MHART, they can help us out with those, those situations um, that are available to us. I mean, the hospital can always help out as well. So there are, there are some agencies in the middle of the night when those issues do come up, because it is hard. There's only so many beds here in Oxford. We know that, mm -hmm. but there might be somebody else too that and we do have to realize not everyone, like Kelly said, wants to go to the shelter. People have choices in their lives. And if that's their choice, it may not be what I would choose for myself. It may not be what you choose for yourself. Sometimes it's choices as well. Mm. Absolutely. So um, I know we had said that, that we would take the panel itself for uh, from seven to eight and then some Q&A for a half an hour. So according to my uh, clock, we have um, just literally a couple of minutes. So if there's something that any of you have that um, is a burning issue that you really want to make sure you share before we wrap up for the evening, um, this is your chance in one minute. Can I quickly go and say, I put in the chat box, sorry, David, I put in the chat box, uh, recovery for all to riff off of what David said in terms of having a voice. Um, it's really important to know that actually this campaign has already made a difference. I was on a call with an MP um, from Toronto and he talked about the, how people had added their voice, sent emails um, to, to their members of parliament, their MPPs, their mayors, through this recovery for all campaign and they had heard it loud and clear and were able to move uh, one billion dollars um, through to communities called rapid housing initiative to get housing on the ground within 12 months for people so i think um, the government is listening and so that's why i put that up there i would say if you feel passionate about this and strong you can do something uh, please add your in addition to smiling and being kind and building relationships but at the sort of more system political level to please go to uh, recoveryforall.ca. Thank you. Um, I will just, uh, in, in closing, just thank each and every one of you and your organizations for the amazing work that you do. And thank each and every one of the other organizations and the volunteer groups and the services and the government services and, and the county and, and, and others, because it, the people are really doing the best they can to try and make a difference, to try and help people in our community. Um, and so uh, I applaud every one of you. It really does matter. And we are thrilled to be able to be a part and a partner in supporting. And we will continue to spread the word about the, the need because once we are aware as a community, 
when we can, when we know more, we can do better. Right. Um, I want to thank you. United okay. Way. Thank you to United Way for all of your amazing funding. There is so much at CMHA that we wouldn't be able to provide to people between M heart walk and canceling the frontline support program. We really appreciate everything that we get from the United Way. Well, thank you. And I can tell you that we couldn't do that if it wasn't for the generosity of the community we live in. And so whether it's people who are going and signing up to do a dollar a, a, a week on payroll or more or individuals who just go online or bring us in a check, it is our community who comes together to help. And so that is how we do it. So thank you. And, and, and again, thank you to our generous community. Um, I thank all of the people who have joined us tonight who are interested in this very important topic, who recognize there is a need to know more so that we can um, really continue to try and move the needle. And so I thank you for joining us. Um, I ask that you share what you've learned tonight. I think between the, the, the powerful film that was insightful and, 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 and heartbreaking and, and yet some joyful um, and uplifting, uh, share that information. It does help when people can understand it's not about choice and it's not about pick yourself up and you can do better. There are so many more complicated, complex issues at play. So when you share that, you can educate others, uh, you can dispel myths um, and you can advocate locally um, as well as, you know, provincially and nationally, but for investments and a commitment to change, because after all, it really does take a village um, to solve this, this issue and, and every other issue that we, we face um, as a community. And so I encourage you to visit uh, the United Way website. We will also, we have a great stories and videos there that you can learn more about local people from their perspective, their voices. We will be sharing reports um, like the project we're working on with Stephanie, as well as reports on our COVID funding dollars and others. So there's good information there. Um, sign up for our e-newsletter. We, I swear we're not bothersome, but it's, it's filled with good information once a month. Um, and if you are in a position to please consider making a donation, we would very much appreciate it. And as Marcy said, if you already have, please know how grateful we are. And I promise you, our staff, our board, and our volunteers um, are committed to using every dollar we have wisely so that we can help our community partners change lives here in Oxford County. So thank you all. Um, please stay healthy, stay safe, and good night. And we look forward to doing this again with perhaps a different topic, but there are great opportunities to come together as a community, even in this difficult time. Thank you and good night. <laughs>